I remember even back when I first came on in 2004 that we were talking about the synchronicity and alignment of what we were thinking LinkedIn would become and what Microsoft already was. But why was now the time for this deal to actually come together? So uh, there had been some uh, kind of friendly kind of mission alignment conversations between myself and Satya and Bill and Jeff over some time. And we had said, look, we're interested in a bunch of different possible corporate relationships. Uh, let's get to that. What we're really focused on right now, which was when those conversations started, is uh, getting the educational mission for LinkedIn started, uh, which resulted in the acquisition of Linda, has a whole you know, kind of five to 10 year roadmap of what we're thinking about. How do you essentially enable uh, the professional world to be constantly reskilling? It's a natural alignment between the LinkedIn mission of saying, how do you maximize the economic potential for every individual, how they invest in themselves, how do they uh, find the right opportunities, but also how they get the right work done, the right business done, with a kind of a focus on individuals. And part of the reason, is, is, as Sarah's uh, mentioning, is that there's this natural alignment between Okay, we're focused on kind of uh, with a, a starting emphasis on career, the productivity of individuals, and Microsoft is focused on the productivity of organizations with obviously being such a, you know, kind of uh, a strong and broad organization that has a wide range of other things as well. And so there's a very natural kind of fit between these missions. And so the question was to say, well, in order to get from, from the LinkedIn side was, in order to get LinkedIn to its next logical step of helping you know, every professional individual on the planet transform their economic career, uh, be more effective, everything from day to day to year by year, um, what's the best way to do that? And, uh, and you know, the discussion was, well, actually, in fact, it seems the best way to do that is to combine with Microsoft. And part of the thing that uh, most matters, I think, in any M&A, uh, beyond the most tiny, is to say the missions really have to align. You'll have to almost look at it as, are the, are the missions friends? Like, would they naturally be, yes, we're working on, on aligned problems and it really matters to both of us that both problems work. And so we took the time to make sure that we were all in sync on that and had a number of conversations. And actually, since the, the sponsors includes intellectual ventures, I had the funny, like one of the things that during this process, I was flying up a group of entrepreneurs to go to the Intellectual Ventures Science Dinner, um, and which, by the way, is the coolest event yeah, I've it's ever awesome. been to. And and actually, I didn't go to that one. I went to one later, which you and I ended up, you know, going to uh, synchronously, uh, synchronously uh, because what happened is like, oh, we I need to talk about something with Bill and Satya. So I literally took up these entrepreneurs, deposited them in Intellectual Ventures, and said, sorry, I have some business things I need to take care of, <laughs> and went over and talked to Bill and Satya. So it was kind of a funny <laughs> under, thing. Under the radar. A little yes, bit. a business thing. <laughs> so now that it's closed, you have joined the board of Microsoft. Was that part of the deal? Uh, no. We talked about it a little bit uh, beforehand, and we decided that it was best in kind of intellectual rigor and in spirit and mission to treat them as two separate items. So one was, look, was the, was the acquisition worth doing on its own? Like, mm -hmm. is it the natural thing for both companies to do? And so we literally, we, we, we had a two minute conversation that was kind of like, we're not gonna talk about this yet. It was like, okay, great, it makes sense. And then when it closed, um, I went through a, I said, look, we're, we'd be really interested in this. Uh, would you be interested? I said, look, obviously Microsoft is, a, is the canonical kind of world technology company for a seriously long time. Its impact in the world is serious. It's, you know, I'm a mission-oriented person, uh, and, you know, I've already committed as part of the deal to help um, more than just the Microsoft LinkedIn integration, but Microsoft more broadly, and this could be one of the ways of doing that. And so I went through a set of interviews with the different board members, and I guess it was early March or something, and mm -hmm. joined the board. So you have one of the most rigorous intellectual models of anybody I know. What are you taking out of being part of an organization like Microsoft with the scale and the focus it has that you're taking back into your process and the way that you spend the rest of your time? So one of the things that's interesting, and I, and I know we're going to get to more talking about Silicon Valley. Silicon Valley is, tends to be very myopic 
uh, tends to be focused on like one or two things, which has some strengths as well as weaknesses. And you know, 20 years ago, there was a huge focus on Microsoft. And then Microsoft, like for example, if you go around Silicon Valley, you see all Mac laptops. You don't see almost any surfaces, et cetera. And one of the things that I actually, in fact, uh, very quickly got up to speed as I started talking to some of the people up here is, you know, deep tech, super interesting, actually, in fact, working on the tech things that are part of the future, even though you don't see that discussion down Sand Hill Road, you don't see that discussion. Like, there, like people say, what do you think about Oculus, not what do you think about HoloLens, right, mm -hmm. generally. Uh, and uh, I think it'd be useful for Seattle and Microsoft to be more in that discussion. That's something I'm going to try to help with. And, um, but that, the learning was, hey, guys, there's a bunch of really good tech up there. We should factor that into the way that we're thinking about. Um, also, I think that um, uh, Daniel and a bunch of others, Satya, of course, most especially, have done a great job of having uh, Microsoft be a more, like, we can partner with you culture. So part of what I have done already in the last couple of months, I've kind of made some connections saying, hey, there's a really great technology here. Maybe this, you know, maybe, you know, maybe you guys should have a conversation because actually, in fact, that partnership could work for both of you. And so I think there's a depth of tech. There's also, like Silicon Valley is really naive across a whole set of things. So like, for example, Silicon Valley tends to be um, uh, like build one product, everyone in the world uses it, just be technologically utopian, don't adjust to local regulation, local politics, you know, et cetera. <laughs> Um, and, and, you know, yeah, you see it in <laughs> so many companies. I mean, it's, that's the reason why it's a cultural pattern. And there's strengths to that, too, but there's also weaknesses. And actually, I think one of the things that I've already started taking from uh, some of the lessons from people like Brad Smith and others is to say, okay, how do you try to get to the, actually a blended strategy where you have some strengths on both sides, and is that a more adaptive, better way of growing and, and so forth? And that's another thing I've already been in the first few months learning from Microsoft. So I want to go back to the technology piece because I think looking forward to technologies and, and where they're going and how they apply is something that you and I have talked about a lot. And I don't get this opportunity very often, so for my own personal benefit, I want to talk about this. Um, you just were, there was a bunch of articles written about how you were one of the backers of a $27 million fund for AI in the public interest. What does AI in the public interest mean? <laughs> I'm not sure anyone knows, including the, uh, <laughs> including the backers. Um, so uh, it's, there, there's an interesting juxtaposition of intellectual views and artificial intelligence based on where you put the pin for where do you think the probability of creating uh, generalized artificial intelligence is in a timeline. So if you're 10 years, you're absolutely, totally frenetic about it and probably a little crazy. If you're 20 years, you're the earliest possible rational, but like there's some magic that happens between then and now, and it's a question mm -hmm. of how you discount that magic. Then you go to 30 to 50, and you go 50 to 100, and you go 100 plus. And people respond differently based on that. But if you even said, like for example, you go to a lot of technologists and say, well, do you think you're gonna create this in 50 to 100 years? And a lot of technologists looking at the pattern at speed at which technology happens, go, sure. You go, do you understand how short 50 to 100 years is mm -hmm. in a human time frame, in political institutions and everything else? So we need to start thinking about, even if you said that was where the probability goes into 20% or 30%, we need to start that now. What are the ethical implications? What do you do? And it's everything from issues that are present now, because you say, well, we use modern machine learning techniques in order to score you know, um, anything from credit worthiness to, you know, uh, responsiveness to health and a bunch of other things. It's like, well, given that the modern kind of deep learning techniques don't actually, in fact, um, aren't, there's a problem which some of you in the room will know, which is, can you introspect the device and can you actually know how it's working? And the answer is actually kind of challenging right now. And so you go, well, is there a hidden bias in it? Is there some serious flaw in it? And it's like hard to know. And so uh, those are ethical issues. And so it ranges all the way from that to, you know, if you're going to create a generalized artificial intelligence, um, what ethics would you like it to have? How would it be embodied? And who says and how does it happen? And, you know, one of the ways that I put this to my techie friends is, um, you know, look, if you could train an AI to be a Buddhist, you'd probably be pretty good, <laughs> right, roughly. Mm -hmm. 
It's like the all sentient life, good. <laughs> like, okay, that, that, that's probably more or less where you want to be in that circumstance. The earliest implementations of AI don't feel that far. Mm. Right? Like the, the things that we've gotten from the big scale cloud and the machine learning. But when you start talking about ethics, you start talking about the decisions of who's going to make the decisions of those implementations of mm -hmm. going from you know, uh, machine learning models that actually work better than human beings based on the experience of human beings to an actual intelligence that runs or exists mm -hmm. in parallel with humanity. Where do those decisions start getting made? Well, so... And how do we know who's making them? So it's really... Uh, too much of a deep fog to have a very solid answer. Okay. Um, I mean, part of the, 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 the simple thing to start, which probably many of the people in the room know, is if AI is through learning versus programming, like people say, well, the machine does what you tell it to do. It's like, well, not if it's a, just a generalized learning algorithm. It's like, yes, you have output, you know, inputs that control it, but you know, what are the set of inputs over, because you know, most uh, deep learning ML techniques take a lot of data. They're working on trying to simplify the data, but you say, okay, how do you know exactly what it's learning? And then you say, well, how do you have what you choose in the algorithms? Well, actually, in fact, the algorithms tend to be relatively mathematically inclined, uh, making classification sets out of large scales of data. So you say, well, it isn't like someone's programming in, you know, uh, let's just use some kind of trivial case, like a, a Wittgensteinian approach mm -hmm. versus a Kantian approach. It's not like there's two different ML algorithms where one is the Wittgensteinians and one is the Kantians. It's like, no, 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 they're like this, this, this way of doing it. And so it's kind of a question of, of how, does that, um, how does that play out? And those are precisely the kinds of questions where people need to start thinking about to start with what will start with really basic answers. Uh, not basic as in you're solid and you're done, but like kind of in the same way that when you started science, you said, okay, well, the, the Earth is set in the universe and everything else rotates around us. Mm -hmm. You just say, okay, <laughs> you know, that's clearly totally wrong now that we figure that out. But you start kind of saying, well, but we see patterns of planets in, in the sky and okay, how do we figure out those planets? Oh, wait, oh, those planets are distinct. They're not just spheres. That's the pattern we have to start going down in asking these questions. So when you've talked about AI, the other technology that you usually talk about in the same general set of questions is the intersection between biology and the digital. Yes. Why is that so interesting to you right now? Um, boy, you're going straight for the, uh, <laughs> the difficult areas. So, um, well, it makes it so, more fun, right? Yes, exactly. <laughs> uh, so um, bio, so let's see, there's, a, there's, there's intelligent technologists that dispute how close generalized artificial intelligence is and how many acts of magic need to get here to get, uh, need to happen in order to have a human level intelligence or better in a silicon configuration using um, you know, uh, those kinds of, of techniques to, to artificially create a new one. However, everyone agrees that the current uh, AI techniques that now that we've gotten to mass amount of computing in the cloud, mass amount of data, and a, enough computing to have deeper neural networks and deeper, you know, deep reinforcement learning are uh, achieving astounding results and we don't yet see an easy ceiling to those results. So specialized AI is in this, you know, amazing curve and we don't know where that, I mean, all curves come to some place where the asymptote, but we can't say, oh yeah, that's next year. Right, we can't say that, oh yeah, well, current chip design and Moore's law seems like it's slowing down, which seems to be something we can say. But by the way, who knows, quantum computing, a bunch of other things, but we can say that because we can see it, but we don't know where that happens in this current machine learning curve. When you tie that to bio, part of the thing that um, is, the question is, uh, the cost of reading genetics is, uh, is coming down a curve faster than Moore's law. Uh, CRISPR-Cas9 is just beginning, so I don't really know what curve it's on. But if you intersect uh, specialized AI, not generalized AI, and these curves, you more or less get to a point where you also are saying in kind of a 50-ish year time frame that, that deliberately or accidentally you could be engineering different versions of the homo genus, just mm -hmm. like you had Neanderthals and David, like you could be doing that accidentally or deliberately. 
It doesn't require AGI, right? And that's almost certain given those curves. And so that intersection is something I've been paying a lot of attention to because it doesn't require the, the, oh, and now there's magic, this problem in AI is solved, and oh, look, we have generalized AI. It's like, no, no, AIs you see today, together with some very simple curves in biology, lead to some science fiction thinking where you go, ooh, that doesn't seem so far-fetched. Mm -hmm. So the interesting thing to me is not just sort of where do these technologies take us and what does that look like when we live in this science fiction world of the future, but what is the impact in the way that we exist as a society, whether it's the United States or globally as a society. Mm. And a lot of the question, especially with AI, is about what does that mean for jobs, right? Especially at the middle class level. Yep. We've seen that technolo technological revolutions have had massive impact there. But the, the compounding effect when you start talking about the intersection of biology and digital is also in an ageless population, potentially, in that same middle class. Yeah. Like, what does that mean? How do we get ahead of that? <laughs> well, uh, I don't think anyone has a good... you have that solved? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I don't think anyone has a good answer, even though there are a few sci-fi books on, on the ageless population, unless somehow we invent reasonable space travel and infinite energy, which, you know, maybe sometime... Elon going to get on that? <laughs> yeah, Elon's on it. <laughs> I yeah, figured. Someone's on it. <laughs> we, top minds are working on it. Uh, um, uh, and so... Uh, so look, it's, I think it's very challenging. I, I think one of the things is a lot of Silicon Valley technologists tend to go to, oh look, we're going to have abundance, um, we're going to have you know uh, robots doing everything, so we're all going to have this utopian agrarian you know kind of life of leisure. I think it's a simplistic model of human nature. I think people like to have a sense of where they feel like they belong, that their position matters, they have a position in the in the tribe, and so I look at basic income as a plan Z. Like, okay, if we can't figure out a better plan, let's do that. I mean, look, certainly, it's, you know, not, it's, in a, it's in the plan set. It's just like, let's see if we can figure out a better plan than it. And I think part of the reason why I've been putting so much more, uh, work in entrepreneurship, uh, both with like Endeavor, which is high impact entrepreneurship around the world, Kiva, which is a platform for uh, micro entrepreneurs, and also for, you know, what are the things that in public, uh, private policy, governments can do around entrepreneurship is, that ultimately what you need to do is try to, like, I think, accelerate and change the, skate, the scope so that entrepreneurship creates those new kinds of work opportunities. And yes, we have this thought of, well, we can do, you know, move from an industrial mode of education where you only teach in college to your learning lifetime, but, uh, and that'll, that'll be important, and that'll be also part of the reskilling. You know, I've pitched some of my uh, government friends on maybe an edu fair, which is, you know, roughly speaking, and say, say these are the skills of the future, and as long as you're a student even at those skills, you're getting a, essentially a stipend. It's a, like a job for learning those skills mm -hmm. as a way of constantly being adaptive. You know, all of those kinds of things I think are important, but I think when you really get down to bedrock, it's gonna be making sure that new kinds of products or services or experiences are being created, and that works. It's a little bit like, okay, maybe we move less from music artists make a ton of money through DVD sales, but through venues and events, and then there's a lot more events. I mean, I'm not, and I'm not saying top-down uh, program that, because centralized programming is a bad economic model, but enable marketplaces, enable networks as a way of doing it, and I think that's the, and that's why entrepreneurship. And so uh, I think that's ultimately where we have to do a lot of work, and then there's a ton of other things, you know, educa ongoing education, public policy programs, uh, ways to help, you know, like the biggest one coming is 35 states, I think, have the top job as truck driver and the current uh, leading of the kind of Uber for trucking is Convoy. It's based here in Seattle. I think it won one of those Geek Wire Awards yeah, yesterday. Last night. Before. Yeah, something it did. like that. Um, and d disclosure, I'm on the board. <laughs> um, the, uh, and... Uh, uh, but, you know, one of the things I started working on is, like, if you, if you go AV trucks, then that's a massive immediate mm -hmm. translocation of a job that a lot of different people can do and what the kinds of things you do about it. And so you, it's the responsibility of us, both technologists and inventors of the future, companies, and government officials and ed education folks to say, okay, what do we do about this? Because these changes are going to be coming 
faster and faster. It's not to say that they aren't solvable. So people say, oh, like that's part of the thing I don't like about the basic income answer. Like one thing to think about when you say, well, you have autonomous vehicles, that shifts not just truckers, but a bunch of other people, but it also opens up space, opens up time, you know, can shift different kinds of productivity by mm -hmm. which people can relocate in various ways and then can do other kinds of work through that relocation. So just like any kind of productivity measure, it can amplify a bunch of other productivity as long as we create that in the requisite amount of time. Sorry, I kept talking. <laughs> All interesting. Let's talk a little bit more about entrepreneurship, though. Mm. So you, you live and work in the Valley, the Silicon Valley, and have been an employee, an entrepreneur, an angel investor, a venture capitalist. When you think about what it is about that ecosystem that works so incredibly well for continuing to spawn entrepreneurship, literally generationally, Yep. What is it that's the secret sauce that makes that happen? Because it's clearly not the only place that entrepreneurs exist. I mean, you just went through a whole bunch of places that are here. There's a lot of things that are going on, endeavors trying to do this all over the world, right? But, but what is it there that we can take and, and either replicate or seems to be unique that we need to learn from? So um, if you talk to most Silicon Valley people, uh, they'll tell you the standard startup story that they've been telling for 30 plus years which is a culture which, generally speaking, doesn't penalize failure, uh, although people frequently think we celebrate failure. We don't do that. <laughs> um, it's kind of silly. Uh, yeah, I want to eliminate fail fast yeah, from a lot fail of fast lexicon. in order to succeed, right. not fail exactly. fast. <laughs> right? That's not, no, failure is not the goal. Uh, and, um, uh, and then, you know, technologists, uh, technology companies, great universities, et cetera, but those exist now in many places in the world. And why is it Silicon Valley continues to produce uh, just a prodigious number of, of world-changing technology? And obviously Seattle does uh, well too. But by the way, like I was just checking this on the phone, like the Seattle region is about 3.6 million people. The San Francisco region is about 4.5 million people. You can kind of look at them as, 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 as approximate um, uh, sizes and why does this play out? And the central thing that I think Silicon Valley does uh, uniquely well everywhere in the world and other than China, although China solves this problem differently, is, is, is something that I taught a class on about 18 months ago called Blitzscaling. I'm working on a book on. I released a podcast, a, a podcast series that started this Wednesday called Masters of Scale with Brian Chesky, who's the CEO and co-founder of Airbnb being the first anchor tenant, the podcast stuff will have uh, Sheryl Sandberg, Mark Zuckerberg, Reed Hastings, Bill Gates, uh, you know, and so on, in terms of like, what are the lessons of scale? And, uh, and one of the things that Silicon Valley does exceptionally well is using the network of Silicon Valley to decision which projects should get capital, talent, et cetera. It's not like a single deciding point, it's kind of a, consensus of, of an aggregation of kind of, you can almost think of it like a neural net of electrical signal that, that triggers the weights, that goes, these are the projects that are building breakthrough momentum that will get to global scale, and then we align all of that. And part of what allows these new companies to scale so fast is, you know, when uh, you know, Zuckerberg is like, look, I've got this great product, and uh, I've, I've, I've invented the kind of social web, uh, and you know, we're actually uncertain about business model. We're sure we have one, but we're uncertain about it. Uh, and we don't really fully run like a modern company. Well, you hire Sheryl Sandberg, <laughs> right? Mm -hmm. And she did this with Google, right? And actually, in fact, when you look at all of the upcoming crops of, of, of uh, Silicon Valley companies, there are, and it's, by the way, it's never you hire the person who did exactly that thing to do that again. No one's interested in going, I'm going to go do the exact same job again if they're smart and ambitious. What you do is say, okay, you participated in this kind of growth ramp, and you've solved some of these kind of problems. Come solve these new problems. Because each, each company, uh, especially within the consumer size enterprise, tends to be a little bit more regular patterned, uh, tends to be like, okay, come solve these problems, and you, then you bring this wealth of knowledge because that genetic combination and recombination between all of these companies that are fierce, fast-moving, learning, and then the genetics 
all go to the new companies that are coming saying, here's what we learned at Google, Facebook, LinkedIn, you know, eBay, Twitter, <laughs> you know, mm -hmm. that, that, that. Like, we learned these things here. Because any company that gets to that kind of, has interesting learnings that are in it. And then they come in, whether it's employees, whether it's investors, whether it's advisors, and that accelerates the learning curve. So like, for example, one thing, um, actually this is an interesting test, I've never asked this about whether this occurs in Seattle. Uh, and if it does, then it will be interesting and different uh, because thus far, uh, everywhere I've gone in the world, the only place that I know that uses the term OODA loop in a business context is Silicon Valley. The Chinese would use it if they had the term, right? So that the, 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 they would use it too. And the OODA loop is observe, orient, decide, act. It's fighter pilot terminology. And what it means is uh, the faster your OODA loop, that fighter pilot survives, the other one dies, right, in a combat. Mm -hmm. Individuals and organizations all throughout the valley talk about their OODA loop, their learning, the speed at which they're moving, et cetera, because they feel that that speed is critical for, there is literally no Silicon Valley, modern Silicon Valley company. There's no modern Silicon Valley company that doesn't actually, in fact, uh, have this kind of speed genetics built into it. Is this basically the essence of blitz blitz scaling? Scaling, Yes. Right. So scale fast. So scale you, and fast. So you did a class at Stanford on this, right? And if, if I remember correctly, I looked at the list before we did this, and basically it was the it was a who's who's list of people who have done amazing modern companies in the valley mm -hmm. who came in and, and literally taught these students by example, this is the key thing where we got our competitive advantage. Talk to me a little bit more about blitz scaling and why that, that is such a critical advantage, especially in consumer and marketplace companies, because that to me was obviously yep. the parallel I was looking at. So, and can you even succeed in consumer and marketplace anymore without blitz scaling? You can, but you'd be pretty lucky, <laughs> right? Like, <laughs> and I want to invest in luck. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's exactly. Um, so roughly speaking, blitz scaling is you deploy a, a, a what seems like a ridiculous amount of capital quickly in order to scale your customer acquisition, your organization, your market size, and throw weight in a way that would generally be considered to be inefficient by like a classic MBA class, right? And so, and then a set of techniques for doing that. And the reason you do that is because you want to realize a market opportunity where being first to scale is the critical thing in order to win. And canonical examples in the current crop would look like Uber or Airbnb, right, mm -hmm. as ways of, of doing this. And so, um, and if, you, if you're playing in the spaces where other people will be blitz scaling, it's very hard for you to compete. Because if someone actually can raise a bunch of capital and can deploy it to advance their position, they may be wrong that the great market opportunity is not there or not. But they're certainly going to throw a huge shadow on your effort. So if they're blitz scaling and you're not, you have a problem. So then the question is, can you get the capital and the talent to al allocate to that? And uh, that's what I was meaning earlier when I said, well, there's this, there's this very useful pattern within the Valley for networking decisioning about which of the projects that are likely to be these next things and then accelerating their curve up. In terms of, and you can see this uh, in talent flows. You can see this in and where do the, uh, the, the investors who generally get their uh, pick of deals, what do they end up investing in, you know, that kind of thing, as a way that this uh, decisioning happens to create these uh, companies. And generally speaking, it's, you know, um, products with network effects, it's things like marketplaces, not only marketplaces, a lot of things that have network effects. And actually, I'm working on an essay right now, um, so will probably publish sometime in the next few months, uh, called The Network Effects of Silicon Valley, because one of the things I, uh, you know, literally every single person involved in the tech industry will know the term network effects and will say that's important. And then probably less than 1% of them can actually define what it is and actually can say, well, these are the different kinds, this is how you measure it and everything else. But that's because they know that that's what's so important in terms of what you're going for. They know that that's the thing. And so, um, uh, anyway. So, this is, yeah, you were right on the time management. I'm glad you warned me about that. So I actually want to make a... Sarah has enough questions for us to sit here all day. And I would do that because I like these conversations immensely and I don't get to do them every day like I used to. Um, I want to actually completely shift gears and yet 
part of what you were talking about with blitz scaling is the model by which I think of the way that you look at how your personal impact is going to be left in the world. Um, you have put a lot of energy behind some nonprofits and a lot of energy behind impact corporations that have really interesting missions and are using what I think of as sort of software models mm -hmm. to solve large scale problems. Yeah. Can you just talk a lot about that, please? <laughs> well, talk a little. So <laughs> or talk a little bit yes. so we can talk about a couple other things. Um, so scale is a very simple uh, thing, which is a number of people impact, depth of impact you have on them, and time, right, over time. Mm -hmm. And so it's a cross product of those three variables. And so when you say, I want to have scale impact, you go, OK, how, what are, how am I maximizing that score? And it's very simple, but it's a, it's a way of looking at it together. And so then you go, OK, why is it that I have a preference for mission and nonprofit orientation that has at least some revenue model and some technology? And that's because usually the technology impacts the number of people you can get to, kind of like diminishing the cost curve. Mm -hmm. And then if you have a revenue model, then you also have time and other kinds of things as part of it. And so um, I've literally done a large number of these kinds of companies and investments and anything from politics to poverty questions in, in, in Africa and other places. Um, I'd say maybe, uh, you know, maybe just as a pick out a relatively recent one, because of Africa, it's like, so uh, one of the things that creates this structural problem between, okay, why is it certain emerging markets have difficulty getting on the same progressive uh, kind of um, productivity curve that the rest of the developed world, and they don't even have things like electronic banking and so forth. So mm -hmm. if you can create a technology that allows electronic dispersal of economics that doesn't require even the, you know, because banking is a very high cost system, the uh, next lower down, uh, then you can begin to get them online to the modern electronic commerce world. So there's a company called Segovia, that's founded by the founders of Give Directly, um, who had this excellent economic model about why uh, sometimes actually just giving money to people is better than microloans, because actually, in fact, they know how to spend it in a way to change their income. And you don't really care. Like, you go to some uh, poor farmer, and you say, well, here's $200, but I want the $200 back. Mm -hmm. He's like, no. <laughs> I want you to change your life and change the community around you, mm -hmm. <laughs> right? Because then that uh, gets a much better inclusion. And they figure out some ways to do that using technology, which included everything from satellite map and, and everything else. And they said, okay, let's change that into a payments technology and let's have that pay payments technology go and let's make it put it in a commercial model such that governments and corporations would actually pay for it because then you have capital that's scaling the whole ecosystem. That's the kind of thing that, you know, kind of hits within a sweet spot of things I'm doing. And actually, given actually some of the earlier comments um, of opening this event, another project that I'm doing is called Opportunity at Work and uh, inclusion of diversity within the tech jobs bonanza is obviously massively important. And so um, I think you're maybe getting time signals. <laughs> um, <laughs> the, uh, and part of that is, um, uh, is how do we get that pipeline the right way? And what Opportunity at Work founder Byron Aguise noticed was that actually, in fact, uh, there's this whole uh, 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 set of, of, of uh, tech boot camps that essentially create, uh, do within six weeks and about $10,000, make your first tech job available. QA, sysadmin, web developer, et cetera. So what if you create a scholarship program and an admittance process, testing program, and a job ramp, and you put all the stuff together with that, and then you focused on diversity inclusion in order to make that work? And it was like, yes, this is, this is critical. And so, because you know, we all own this, we have to solve it. And it's like, that's another one. And eventually that would be self-sustaining because actually, in fact, pro uh, providing a, a uh, scholarships that could be loans and repaid if you get a hired, if you get a good tech job, on, if and only if, and then um, a job placement could be an economic model, and then you've got something that is a social good that's self-funding. You need to look at Ada Developers Academy here. Okay, great, it's awesome. It's worth your time. Well, yeah, follow up later. Where are we falling short in that area? Like, what, what's the next area that you think there's an opportunity to apply this kind of model to have a societal mm -hmm. impact, either in in government, in huh. people's lives, U.S., <laughs> outside. There well, you go. <laughs> um, 
Well, look, um, uh, where do you start? Uh, maybe I'll take one as a minor pet peeve, just because like, then it's been days on this topic. So like, for, it's obvious that if you had a tech forward policy from government, you would have something that's kind of the equivalent of an electronic driver's license with identity on it. Mm -hmm. where that identity could be a platform for a lot of other things within the social world. It could be anything from voting to social services and everything else. And you would figure out, now, uh, you know, governments usually are not that good at the cybersecurity and everything else. So they have to figure out public-private and make that work the right way and whatnot. So, but if you did that, that becomes a platform for everything else, right? I mean, like most of, like it, it's kind of baffling when you go, when you look at what are the tech issues that are being discussed as relevant within government, which is kind of, let's, get, let's skate to where the puck was years ago, <laughs> right? <laughs> right, <laughs> right, <laughs> you know, as opposed to where the puck's going. Or even, hey, I'll settle for where the puck is, that's good. <laughs> Do you think there's any particular problems that are far better served by nonprofits? Versus oh yeah, profits. generally. I mean, like for example, on nonprofits, um, you know, places where you uh, actually, in fact, uh, community ownership, uh, volunteer participation, uh, notions of, of like for example, a revenue model that could be, call it approximately self-sustaining. Mm -hmm. Like say, for example, your revenue model could only get you to sixty percent of self-sustaining. Well, then actually, it's still a good nonprofit because then people can do donations. Say, oh, this is important but then I'm getting leveraged on my donation. So all of those kinds of things, are, I think, are m much better at nonprofits. Okay, I think I'm getting, getting flagged. So I'm just <laughs> gonna close this. Shifting gears, because we used to do this all the time. It was one of my favorite things. This is the rapid fire. Don't overthink this. What's the last great book you read? Uh, Sapiens. What are you currently binge watching? Binge watching? Mm -hmm. Oh, uh, John Oliver. <laughs> That's awesome. Scott or bourbon? Uh, bourbon. Android or iOS? Oh, iOS. <laughs> settlers of Catan or trumped up cards? Um, as settlers, it's a better game. It's a better design game. I mean, trumped up cards is fun. Best swag you ever got Best. or gave? Well, okay. So best since the the best uh, well swag that I've given is. I think Settlers of Catan is such a well-designed board game. It's the board game for entrepreneurship that I made a knockoff called Settlers of, of uh, Startups of Silicon Valley. That's literally, it's the same rules, but just a different uh, skinning set to it. And I don't sell it or anything because you, know, you honor entrepreneurs and the people who created Settlers. And you want, I want everyone who has a box of Startups of Silicon Valley to have bought their box of Settlers of Catan. Mm -hmm. But it's kind of the, look, here's a way to think about this as an entrepreneurial board game. All right, now you have to add, so what's the best swag you ever got? Oh, uh, best swag I've ever gotten. Um, do we people really have answers to that question? Um, Probably not. <laughs> uh, bottles of tequila at lunch. Fantastic. <laughs> <laughs>